Franklin, and this is Law School Strategy, How I Graduated from Law School with a Job. How I Graduated from Law School is a series of interviews with practicing attorneys and legal professionals to find out more about their career journeys. This week, the ABA is hosting their annual mid-year meeting in Miami, Florida. I can't think of a better time to talk with none other than the ABA president herself, Linda Klein. She was kind enough to share her journey from law school to practicing attorney, as well as some insights into new programs launched by the ABA and a new lawsuit they filed against the Department of Education. Please enjoy this special episode of Law School Strategy, How I Graduated from Law School with a Job. On this episode, I'm extremely honored to be talking with the president of the American Bar Association, Linda Klein. President Klein, it's a pleasure to be talking with you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So I'll go ahead and kick it off with the first question. What did you do or study before law school, and then why did you go to law school? I'll take them in reverse order. Uh, when I was about six years old, my grandfather told me stories about him uh, starting a grocery store in 1929. And he was a grocer during the Depression. And he told me stories about the first forms of public assistance. And he told me stories about how when public assistance was given out at, at the very beginning during the Depression, that there were wealthy ladies in the community who would come to his store and they would sit on a stool in the back of the store and decide what the poor people could eat that week. And my grandfather told me that that was very humiliating and that people shouldn't be treated that way, that they should have enough dignity to pick the food that their family should eat. Uh, there were cultural differences, uh, that some people preferred potatoes, some people preferred pasta, uh, but those people had to eat whatever the rich ladies decided that they would eat. Uh, and my grandfather said that sometimes he would exchange the food. And that impressed on me that uh, we needed, we need people to have, be able to have uh, dignity in their lives. and. My grandfather inspired me to go to law school to help people. I was fortunate uh, that until my third year of law school, in fact, until six weeks before graduation, I was privileged to have all four of my grandparents. And they taught me a lot of, uh, a, a lot of facts about people who were aging that didn't have access to their medication, they didn't have access to food and a safe place to live. And, and candidly, I was motivated to go to law school, not only to help people, but specifically to help people who were senior citizens. And I had in my mind that I was gonna start the gray legal clinic for gray hair. Um, <laughs> but I did take a different path in law school. Uh, so uh, I became a lawyer, but I never started the gray legal clinic. Uh, although in my pro bono life, uh, my very first pro bono case was helping a, a senior citizen who was impaired. Uh, you asked me what I did, what I studied as an undergraduate, and as an undergraduate, I studied political science. Uh, I thought that if I didn't go to law school, maybe I would become a political campaign consultant. Uh, that wasn't to be, uh, but I, I did go to, I did go to law school, and I studied a pretty much a standard. A law school curriculum. I graduated from Washington and Lee uh, many years ago. Great. Well, thank you so much for that background. That's definitely a very worthy cause to go to law school for. So, um, so now the question that everybody wants to know, did you graduate from law school with a job? And if you did, how did you get that job after law school? I did graduate from law school with a job. Uh, I graduated from law school before we had email, before people used the internet. Uh, we didn't really have memory typewriters much that I remember. We had mag cards. I won't even bother to tell you what they were, but they were basically these flat uh, things that looked like uh, uh, cassette tape. And we, we could save our resumes on that if we had access to a mag card reader. Uh, I tell you all of this because a job search in those days required going to a professional printer and having your resume printed on a very thick stock paper, and then picking cities where you thought you might want to uh, practice law, and you would mass mail to all of the law firms you could find. And what I remember in law school is that because so many of us were sending so many resumes out that we would inevitably, lots of us would get lots of rejection letters. And some of the rejection letters were kind of funny. And my classmates would post their rejection letters all over the law school. Uh, <laughs> we all had study carols. 
and we would post rejection letters all over the law school. I, I remember uh, one, uh, one of my classmates who was, let's just call him John Smith IV, and he got an, a, a letter addressed to Mr. Iv as an IV, as in the fourth. So we, we, had, lot, we had lots of funny times. <laughs> Uh, but it was a it was a different time, and I don't think that anybody does a does a job search that way anymore. And candidly, it was very expensive to do a job search like that. Certainly, well, I think it's amazing that you said that you got actual responses back for every letter you sent. Was that was that typically normal? I can't say that we all got responses for every letter, but in those days, yes, usually uh, a, a letter. Uh, often it was a form letter. Many of us would get the same letter from the same law firm, uh, just <laughs> dressed differently. Uh, certainly Mr. Iv got one, uh, but yes, most of us got responses. So how many jobs do you think that you applied to over the course of your law school career or internships even? Is that kind of what led you to getting that first job after law school? No, not really. Uh, so in those days, we really didn't have many internships that I know about. Uh, the big deal was to try to get a job after your first year of law school. Uh, what I did was I looked around for the largest city in the U.S. that didn't have a law school, and I sent a whole bunch of resumes to law firms there thinking that uh, it might be more difficult for them to find summer clerks, and I was right. And I was able to get a, a job after my first year of law school uh, because, precisely because of that. Uh, then because I had that job after my first year of law school, I believe it was easier to get a summer clerk position after my second year of law school, which I got in a larger city at a larger law firm. And then uh, after, after my second year of law school, I thought uh, more about what city I'd like to live in and chose uh, to look more around Atlanta, Georgia, which is what I did. And I applied to a variety of law firms here. Again, remember, we're sending out lots of resumes, printed resumes. I think mine was on some pretty light blue colored paper, professionally printed with a cover letter, uh, professionally typed, mailed in a beautiful envelope that matched the resume and the cover letter with a first class stamp. And then did a variety of interviews here in Atlanta with various law firms and, and settled on, on one. So I don't want to do any spoilers because I obviously know the next steps, but um, I'm going to go ahead and ask you, have you ever changed jobs at any point in your career or law firms? Have you ever changed a law firm at any point? So pretty much if, you, if I would trace back, I guess I've had really two jobs. So I was in my first law firm for three years and then I moved on to another law firm. We merged with another law firm who merged with another law firm. And so I guess... <laughs> In all my years of practice, I've really just had two jobs. The name on the door might have been different, but I've really just had two jobs. Great. So what has it been like? Um, I know that you were an uh, early leader in your law firm and one of the very few women leaders in the Atlanta area, if I'm correct. So what was that like um, being in a leadership position? I, it was something that I, it was, it was a privilege that my partners elected me to be the managing partner in the firm. Uh, and I did my best to grow the firm and lead the firm. Uh, learned a lot about finances, uh, certainly, and I think that that makes a, a huge difference. So having the, the privilege and the opportunity to be a law firm leader was something that candidly, uh, I believe I, I was prepared for because I was a bar leader. Definitely, definitely. So um, one of the things that um, the ABA has recently launched, and because you have background in law firm leadership, I wanted to ask you, um, how do you see the newer initiatives like that ABA blueprint? Um, how do you see that offering valuable resources to young lawyers that are starting out either a solo practice or that might be joining a smaller law firm? I'm so glad you asked about ABA blueprint because it's really a, a special favorite of mine. Uh, last year when I was president-elect of the American Bar Association, I went around the country mostly to smaller law firms and or smaller cities where most of the lawyers were in smaller law firms. And I asked them uh, what surprised them about practice, practicing law. And what they told me was how little time they had to practice law because of all the administrative burdens of running a law firm. And I got this idea for what has now become ABA Blueprint. I'll tell you, we called it Project Artichoke for a while because we didn't have a <laughs> 
Uh, and everyone, go ahead. I won't be offended if you go to look at ABABlueprint.com while we're having this conversation. Uh, but ABABlueprint.com is where you can find, uh, find this information. Uh, it is a very special opportunity, a one-stop shop for lawyers, particularly in solo and small firm practices, to get everything they need in one place. Uh, the case management software, project management software, uh, a virtual receptionist, uh, a way to take credit cards for payment, anything you need to run a law practice is there, and also insurance. Uh, there are special features if you're an ABA member. Uh, you can get a half hour of free practice management consultation. Uh, ABA members get a very deep discount. Uh, one of the pieces of software, uh, if you buy it through ABA Blue, deep discount, it will pay ABA dues uh, for, for you every year if you're a solo. Uh, know that first year law students, like law students, get free ABA dues. So you really have nothing to lose uh, choosing ABA Blueprint. Uh, recently, I visited with a, an incubator here in Atlanta. And the lawyers there were, of course, all starting out their own solo practices. And they were very impressed with what Blueprint had to offer them and the steep discounts that were offered as well. Wow, it definitely sounds like a great program. And I love the fact that you personally had the idea for it and have overseen that. And I'll be sure to put a link. Um, there will be a link in the description below for those of you watching on YouTube. And if you're listening to the podcast app, um, go ahead. There will be a link in the show notes as well. So ABABlueprint.com. I will certainly share that. So thank you for getting that up and started. It sounds like a wonderful resource. We're really um, excited. Yes, definitely. So we're, going back to your law school and maybe early law firm days, were there any times that you struggled or faced any challenges, um, either through the job search or just as a young lawyer or law student in general? I would say that um, while my firms didn't change, my practice changed. I don't know if you want to call it a struggle necessarily, um, but I, I think that that it's important to know that uh, that when we were all looking for jobs, some of us got frustrated by how many letters we had to send out and how expensive it was to do. Uh, I think what you might be more interested in learning about is how, while I've been at so several law firms, it's really just been two, and while my firms didn't change, my practice changed. And I think everybody who's starting out their career needs to know that just because you're practicing X type of law, uh, in your first couple of years of practice doesn't mean that that's where you're going to, to stay. So for example, I began practicing law in an insurance defense practice. And from that, I got more involved in professional liability and I started representing doctors and lawyers that were sued for malpractice. And then from there, I started representing architects and engineers. And from there, all of a sudden, I was practicing construction law in a much broader sense than just professional liability. And then I was doing arbitrations because a lot of construction dispute resolution uh, involves arbitration. And arbitration in those days was pretty unusual. So there were not a lot of lawyers practicing arbitration. And then from there, mediation was a new concept. And so I suddenly became uh, someone who had a lot of experience in arbitration and mediation. Then the next thing I knew, I was asked to be a neutral. I was asked to be an arbitrator. I was asked to be a mediator. Well, there's so much construction on college campuses, I started adding higher education law to my portfolio. So you can see how your career can develop. A door opens and you walk through it and then another door opens. That's amazing. And I, I know that's certainly helpful for law students um, and recent grads that are currently looking for a job because it's easy to pigeonhole yourself into thinking that you want to be in one practice area or you, if you don't get into a practice area that might be what you think is your passion that you'll never get there in general. Um, so I, I think that's very important advice. So one, one follow up question to that. Okay, well, I was yeah. going to follow up myself. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I'll let, you, I'll let you go first. So my advice would be take the job whatever it is before you, because that experience on your resume is going to be very special. And from that job, so many opportunities will come forward. That may not be your dream job at first, but I guarantee you if you stick to it, your dream job will come. You just keep looking. And candidly, there's an old expression, the harder I work, the luckier I got. I think you'll find that to be true. 
<laughs> I love that. I've actually never heard that before. So I actually really like that. That's an excellent, excellent quote. Um, so my, my follow-up question was um, going through so many different practice areas, a young attorney might not know where to find resources or might not have a senior attorney that, that has experience in that practice area. So what advice would you give to a, a law student or a recent grad that's ex being exposed to a new area of law that they're not familiar with? What steps would they should they take? Um, what, what steps should they take to get more information? I'm going to tell you a story about why the American Bar Association did that for me. A lawyer, uh, there was a, an, an older lawyer, more experienced lawyer, who unfortunately passed away 20 years ago. And I would bring my files to ABA meetings. And he would generously go through those files with me. I've told the story before, so if anybody's watching this and has heard it, I apologize. But uh, I would say, how much is this case worth? And he was from Long Island, New York, and I lived in Atlanta, Georgia. And he'd say, in Nassau County, New York, it's worth $500,000. And in Brooklyn, New York, it's worth $3 million. And in the Bronx, New York, it's worth $6 million. And in Georgia, nothing. He was always <laughs> right. <laughs> I love that. So yeah, that was kind of what I was I was guessing. I, I, I was thinking you're going to say the ABA was a great resource. And I know that the ABA has different sections and divisions and groups that, that can provide those kind of resources. And that's honestly where I found my home is in the section of intellectual property law. So, so I think that's a great point to make that the ABA does have a lot of different opportunities and avenues that, that young lawyers can explore and find seasoned attorneys that can provide guidance or serve as a mentor even. So yeah. What I found is that ABA members are incredibly generous with their time. And just as my experience was many years ago, today now every law student can be a member of the ABA for free. First year lawyers can be a member of the ABA for free. After your second year, it's still pretty inexpensive. And if you use Blueprint, it'll be free with your savings. So you can reach out to members in, in the sections that have that kind of information that you want. As a law student, you can join five sections for free. So you've got plenty of room with plenty of people who would be just happy to help you. And I also know that the ABA's law student website has a lot of resources uh, for uh, young lawyers and law students. Excellent. Yes, I will definitely throw in a link to both the YLD, the Young Lawyers Division, and the LSD, the Law Student Division, um, in the YouTube comments below, as well in the show notes for the podcast. Um, so moving on to a different topic, I, I wanted to give us a chance to touch on the recent lawsuit that was filed by the ABA in December against the U.S. Department of Education, and it was regarding the Public Service um, Loan Forgiveness Program. Um, as a recent law school graduate myself, I know there are likely there's likely only a small portion of law students that weren't aware of the program because it was something that law students um, that were interested in seeking to pursue a public service job were aware of and, and knew the options that it provided by going to law school. Um, so as the ABA president, um, what advice would you give to both current students and recent graduates that may have been planning on taking advantage of the benefits of this program um, and the benefits that it provides to law students. Um, what, what would you advice would you share? Why don't we start, if I can go back to why we filed the lawsuit. Certainly. So, at, for those of you who don't know the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, it was signed by President Bush II in 2007. And what it said was that if you worked in a public service job for 10 years and paid 10% of your income toward your loans, that after 10 years, your remaining loan balance would be forgiven. Now, as you know, law school is not necessarily cheap. In fact, it's very expensive. And some people in some of the public service jobs actually saw their loan balances grow. And starting sometime in the spring of last year, lawyers who worked at the American Bar Association started getting letters, and even though from the Department of Education, and even though year after year they were getting letters from the Department of Education telling them that they were in a qualifying job, that they had paid so many months toward their 10 years, and that they had so many months to go before their loan would be forgiven, that they were getting letters that said, remember what we told you all those years? We're taking it back. Retroactive. Retroactive. It was really very, very upsetting. And these are people who relied on these letters year after year. 
and continued to work in public service in reliance on those letters. I was shocked. Representatives of the ABA staff leadership met with representatives of the Department of Education. That didn't work. As ABA president and the president-elect, the executive director of the ABA, we went to meet with uh, a very leading official at the Department of Education in September. We were told that we would have a response in, in about 30 days. We received our response on December 1, and there was no relief. So on December 20th, with pro bono assistance from the law firm of Ropes and Gray, the ABA and four individuals filed suit against the Department of Education. These people were betrayed, and we're going to work hard to help them. So we have lawyers that work at the ABA. We have lawyers that work at the American Immigration Lawyers Association, paralyzed Vietnam veterans. Uh, there are a variety of lawyers out there. And, and by the way, public service loan forgiveness is not limited to lawyers. So there could be social workers and teachers and others. We don't know who's gotten these letters. Uh, somebody said, well, why didn't you do a Freedom of Information Act request? And in fact, one of the lawyers did a Freedom of Information Act request and got back 198 blank redacted pages. So we really do not know what was behind the decision, but we intend to fight for public service loan forgiveness. The ABA had a grassroots campaign that a lot of the law students were involved in, and I'm sure that you can put the uh, links to both the, the press release about the lawsuit, to you can see copies of the lawsuit and the attachments, and you'll see these letters as members of the press did and wrote about that they saw letters that uh, said you qualified and then now you don't. So if you would add all of that, then everybody watching this can see. So if I were a law student now, to answer your specific question, if I were a law student now and I was considering a career in public service, well, I certainly hope that you do but I do want you to follow this lawsuit very carefully so that you will understand whether you can take advantage of public service loan forgiveness. There are other programs besides public service loan forgiveness that perhaps you could consider as well, but unfortunately, until this lawsuit is resolved, we can't tell anyone that they can for sure rely on public service loan forgiveness. Thank you so much for that explanation and then also the advice. Um, I will be sure, as you mentioned, to put the links down below. And then also, um, does the ABA have a website? Because I, I remember specifically back when we were doing on the um, ABA, the Twitter account was doing all these um, campaigns trying to raise, aware, raise awareness of what was going on. And so in addition to the links to actually read the letter, um, are there action points that you can recommend, whether it's contacting representatives or anything like that, that, that current law students or recent grads can do to take part in making an effect and joining the ABA in this fight? So in the last Congress, when zeroing out public service loan forgiveness was proposed, we did start a grassroots campaign. And young lawyers and law students, we had the hashtag loan, the number four, and givenness, and, and I wore my badge proudly. Uh, we had little buttons that said save uh, loan forgiveness with the hashtag on it. But right now, we're in litigation. So uh, it would be, it, it, we really wouldn't have a, a, a campaign like that. Now, if Congress, again, talks about uh, zeroing out public service loan forgiveness, then we'll be back with that grassroots campaign. Great. Thank you so much for that overview. And again, thank you for the insights and sharing what's going on. Um, so we're almost out of time. So I want to follow up with the very last question and just ask um, generally, is there any closing advice or guidance that you'd like to share with law students or recent grads about finding a job? I would say when you show up for a job interview, look the part overdress a little bit, be very conservative in your dress. Uh, I would watch uh, the way I, I sit at the, at the uh, table. I would make eye contact with the person interviewing. I would know a lot about the job. If it's at a law firm, know a lot about the law firm, do your research, know who you're going to meet, uh, and also show enthusiasm for the job that you want. Explain why you want the job. Have a smile. Uh, be excited about it. And then when you get the job, do the best job you can. Ask questions, find mentors, uh, work harder than everyone else, and you will find that you're going to learn very quickly and you're going to become a really good lawyer very quickly too. 
take advantage of all the opportunities that the Bar Association has to offer, be active, get to know people, know lawyers who are senior to you, seek their advice, they're going to be happy to help. And that's the beginning of a successful career. Well, that is such wonderful advice. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, President Klein. I really appreciate you taking the time. And I know everybody listening appreciates you taking the time to share share your story and then also to hear about what's going on with the ABA and, and resources and, and tips. So again, thank you. I'm going to give you my Twitter handle, at Linda Klein Law. And if you need to reach me by email, ABA President at AmericanBar.org. I look forward to hearing from everybody and best of luck. Excellent. You already answered my next question was how to get in touch. So certainly, and I'll include links to both of those things you just mentioned, your Twitter, your Twitter handle and the email address in the YouTube description and also in the podcast show notes. Thank you again. And thank you everybody for listening. And again, subscribe on YouTube and we now have a podcast feed. So I look forward to seeing all the reviews and positive subscriptions. Thank you. Thank you.